All right, so we're on the hour, so I will go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Dr. Laurel Messer. I work at the Barbara Davis Center for Diabetes in Aurora, Colorado, United States. And um, it is an honor to be part of the Advisor Academy and uh, talking to you today about advanced diabetes systems. And just for um, some context, we're going to, I'm gonna be speaking for about 20 minutes and we'll have a little bit of time at the end for questions. You have the ability to type in a question and I'll take a look at the end and see if we can get those addressed. So uh, let's get started. So the title of my talk today is Contextualizing Advanced Diabetes Devices Using the CARES Paradigm, which is a whole lot of words, but I'm gonna break that down so that it, it makes sense. So let me start here. So um, what we're going to do in this talk today, I'm gonna, I wanna talk about how advanced diabetes devices are fundamentally different from each other, even devices that are part of the same class. And then I'm gonna talk about um, our CARES paradigm, which is an acronym for how a system calculates, adjusts, reverts, how to educate and sensor share characteristics of devices, and using this as a framework for highlighting uh, differences and similarities between devices. And then uh, in the few minutes I have at the end, I'm gonna talk briefly about kind of some practical use of advanced devices and what, what else can we know and do to help uh, people using these devices for diabetes care. So we're gonna start with how advanced diabetes devices are fundamentally different from each other. So um, I thought it would be interesting, a uh, term that we've heard a lot about in the past several years is automated insulin delivery. But what I've found working in this space is that it means many different things to different people. And so just doing a brief literature review, I found that automated insulin delivery has been used to mean fully closed loop uh, control, closed loop control, hybrid closed loop control, um, systems that both automate basal and also some uh, correction doses. Um, I've heard it used specifically for auto mode. Uh, I've heard it used in context of what's called bionic pancreas and even predictive low glucose suspend. And so I think this is a, a it's words that mean something, but it's not very clear exactly what the definition of automated insulin delivery is. It can mean many things. So actually a term that I prefer for, for the majority of the, these devices is um, an advanced diabetes device. And what I'm referring to are, are essentially any devices that go beyond a traditional insulin pump and sensor. So when the JDRF laid out a roadmap um, four years ago now, for how, how insulin will become more and more sophisticated and algorithms will automate more insulin delivery. It started with systems that would suspend insulin delivery for low glucose levels and then suspend for predicted low glucose levels and then get to the point of automating insulin delivery both to prevent hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia, um, eventually getting to the point where we will have a completely closed loop system, um, and also including the idea that some systems in the future may be bihormonal uh, with insulin and glucagon or other other iterations as well. So when I talk about advanced diabetes devices, I'm really including this entire spectrum and not, not really living in any one of those spaces. So looking at what we have today, um, we have devices that are commercially available around the world for insulin suspension, for predictive suspension, and also for what, what we call automated insulin delivery in the context of a hybrid closed loop. So devices that suspend insulin for low glucose levels include the Minimed 530G and the Minimed 630G. Uh, in the United States and in select other countries. And then for predictive low glucose suspend, in the United States, we have the Tandem Basal IQ, which will uh, eventually be disseminating worldwide. And then Minimed 640G, which was never available in the United States, but is available elsewhere. And the 670G, when it's working in its manual mode, also has a predictive low glucose suspend feature in it. And then for hybrid closed loops, which is sort of the third phase here of advanced diabetes devices, the Minimed 670G, which was FDA approved two years ago and is now available in Europe and other regions of the world as well. Um, and Control IQ, which is not FDA approved yet, um, but the, the idea is that it should be on the market um, hopefully in the next year. It is currently undergoing regulatory review. And so we're about to have um, another device on the market that automates insulin delivery. So what's interesting is 
um, the systems that currently suspend insulin, they actually do do it in the same way, but the systems that uh, predictively suspend insulin do it in a different way. They actually are different from each other. They don't have identical algorithms in their in their um, hardware. And likewise for um, hybrid closed loop therapy, the 670G and the future control IQ will also not automate insulin delivery in the same way. So to make a you know, nerdy, nerdy pun here about sensing a theme, the theme of advanced diabetes devices are that they are not the same. And even within the same class of device, they are functioning in different ways. And um, I don't expect that any clinician out there is going to be you know, an algorithms expert on these, but there are some pretty significant clinical and practical impl um, implications for having um, devices do different things. So this is where I want to talk a little bit about uh, the CARES paradigm as a way to understand how these devices are different and how they are the same from each other. So um, I'm going to pick on Dr. Nimri, who is the Advisor Academy um, Program Director here. Uh, Dr. Nimri is a clinician as well. And so the idea would be when Dr. Nimri is seeing uh, a person with diabetes in clinic and they hand her a device, regardless of what it is, the clinician needs to know some fundamental um, some fundamental pieces of information about this device. They need to know, what does this device do? I mean, we know it, auto it gives insulin, but we need to know something about how that happens. How can I, as a clinician, make insulin dosing adjustments so that I can really optimize their use of the device? And also, how can I give them practical education that is meaningful for this particular device? So these are, I think, the things that um, we think about when we are sitting in a room with a person with diabetes who needs help with their insulin delivery device. So um, I have been working in the device diabetes space for 15 years and um, in research I'm able to work with these devices years before they come out into clinical practice and so throughout the years our team has sort of developed an idea of, of some of the key principal points when dealing with new devices because we handle this all the time. And that is where the CARES paradigm came out. I published this in Diabetes Technology and Therapeutics earlier this year. And um, I'm also happy to send a copy to anybody who would like to see it. But this has um, sort of spelling out my CARES paradigm for advanced diabetes devices. So CARES stands for Calculate, Adjust, Revert, educate and sensor and share. So the calculation part of this is asking or rather answering the question, how does this system calculate insulin delivery? Again, not on the level as an algorithm engineering expert, but on the level of a clinician understanding basically what the device is doing. And then what parts of insulin delivery are automated with this advanced device? For the adjustment piece, um, it's important that we know how we can adjust insulin doses or how we can teach individuals with diabetes to uh, adjust insulin doses, which parameters are fixed in the system and which ones we can modify. And then for revert, we need to know when the system either is going to revert automatically into an open loop or what you could call like traditional insulin pump therapy, or when the user, the user should actually elect to turn off the advanced features and have the system run as a traditional insulin pump. So that's the revert part of CARES. Uh, it's important to understand key education points for each device. And in our current device landscape, there are some pretty significant uh, sensor features and capabilities that are different by brand. Um, I think in the future, this will not be as significant a difference as um, glucose sensors kind of all go toward the same level of accuracy and level of um, user engagement. But for now, there are important differences. So I'm going to use the CARES paradigm to talk about uh, hybrid closed loops, the 670G, and the tandem control IQ, which again, I will say is not FDA approved or available commercially anywhere in the world, but the thought is that it will be fairly soon, and it's important that we start thinking about how it's different from the 670G. They're not equal. So 670G, as a reminder, is a uh, uh, the hardware on this is the 670G insulin pump and a Guardian 3 sensor, and it works in two modes. It works in auto mode or manual mode. And auto mode is the automated or the advanced features of the system. This is where it will automate basal insulin delivery, um, and that 
that dose is based on a total daily dose calculation. And what the system will do is target a glucose level of 120 milligrams per deciliter, which is 6.7 millimoles per liter, um, and then give more or less basal delivery to achieve that target. Um, users and clinicians can only adjust insulin to carbohydrate ratios and active insulin time when it's running in auto mode. User still needs to bolus. So this is what we would call a hybrid closed loop system because the user is still responsible for delivering boluses. The system also works in manual mode, which is, a, a, again, a traditional insulin pump or sensor augmented pump. And the system will um, have users exit into manual mode under certain conditions. Uh, the current sensor for the 670G is the Guardian 3, which takes two to four calibrations per day to keep the sensor running accurately. Um, one way that I, I think is important for clinicians to think about insulin delivery and what they're doing when they see a person in clinic using the system is thinking about how, how we can optimize insulin doses. And with traditional insulin pumps or the 670G in manual mode, there are a variety of settings that um, the users or the clinicians can modify, which includes correction targets, basal rates, sensitivities, carb ratios, and active insulin time. For the 670, some of this gets taken away. So um, the algorithm target is fixed at 120. The correction target is fixed at 150. The basal rates are now automated and the user cannot adjust them. And the sensitivity correction factor is fixed as well. So an important highlight for 670G is that users can adjust carb ratios and insulin action time. And that is all they can do to help optimize delivery while it's running in auto mode. So let's contrast that with the Control IQ system. So this is um, a Tandem X2 insulin pump is the hardware. Dexcom G6 is the sensor, and it's a Control IQ specific algorithm that will be um, downloaded onto the insulin pump hardware itself. So it's a software upgrade, which is something kind of new and interesting. Um, it automates basal rates uh, based on programmed basal rates. So when the user programs their basal rates or the clinician, those are used as the starting point for basal insulin delivery. However, the system does automate based on those starting points to either increase basal insulin delivery if glucose levels are hyperglycemic or decrease them if they're hypoglycemic. And actually those are not quite the right terms for that. The target that the system is targeting to is um, 112.5, to 160 milligrams per DL, or 6.2 to 8.9 millimoles per liter. And so if, if glucose levels are predicted to be above this target range, it will increase program delivery or decrease it if it's uh, predicted to be below it. Another um, aspect of the system that's interesting is it also has automated correction doses, which is 60% program sensitivity. So it gives essentially a 60% automatic correction bolus up to once every hour. The user can adjust basal rates, carb ratios, and insulin sensitivity factor. Um, another feature of this device is it will stay in the hybrid closed loop, the control IQ mode, all the time with the exception of um, if it loses CGM data. So um, again, looking at what can be modified in our traditional insulin pump, with control IQ, the correction target is fixed, the, action, the insulin action time is fixed, but the basal rate, sensitivity, and insulin to carb ratios can be adjusted. So using the CARES paradigm to sort of contrast these two devices side by side, uh, I'll, run through the, I'll, I'll run through the acronym um, one by one. So first of all, how they calculate, 670G automates basal delivery based on a total daily dose, and Control IQ automates basal delivery based on those pre-programmed basal rates as the starting point. And it additionally delivers an auto correction up to every once per hour. In order to adjust insulin delivery in each of these six systems, the 670 uh, users and clinicians can modify carb ratios and insulin active time, action time. And for Control IQ, they can modify basal rates, insulin to carb ratios, and sensitivities as well. When to revert to open loop or traditional insulin pump therapy. For the 670G, the system will automatically revert people to open loop for prolonged hyperglycemia, minimum or maximum insulin delivery, um, internal calculations, if there's no CGM data or if there are sensor integrity concerns. The control IQ will largely stay in the hybrid closed loop mode unless there's a loss of CGM data, in which case it can't automate basal insulin delivery. 
In terms of educating, this I think is one of the most important parts of learning what these devices are and how they're different. When I meet with an individual using a 670G, I really make sure to discuss with them the importance of following system prompts to stay in auto mode. This usually refers to entering a blood glucose level and increasing the insulin to carbohydrate ratios to make the system more aggressive. If they want the system to run in tighter control, giving many boluses and strengthening that ratio can help. For Control IQ, I have a different set of education points. I talk about the importance of not overriding boluses by increasing them up. Because of the auto corrections and basal increases, there's likely more insulin on board than they realize, and it can lead to more glycemic variability and having hypoglycemia after the bolus. There's a sleep schedule involved in Control IQ, which will slightly change how the system automates overnight. So that's an important part of setting up the system. And um, as a sort of shorthand, if I can't remember what doses you can change in Control IQ, I tell clinicians to try to change in insulin doses as if it's a traditional insulin pump. And the reason for that is any, any parameter in the pump that can't be changed, like for example, the correction target, it will gray it out when you're physically pushing on the pump. So you will know there are certain parameters that you can't change. And for sensor and share, the, the 670G currently requires a Guardian 3 sensor, which needs two to four calibrations per day, and there's not currently remote monitoring available. For the Dexcom G6, um, which is part of the Control IQ system, it is a factory calibrated system. It can be used for insulin dosing without uh, a blood glucose being done as well, and you can remote monitor with the G6 um, app. So what about tomorrow? These are, these are two systems that we, we are about to have um, commercially available. Coming up beyond Control IQ, Omnipod has a hybrid closed loop coming out called Horizon that they are working on pivotal trials for. Diaboloop has already received CE mark and may be available for use in the near future. And Tidepool Loop is another, um, another system that's being worked on, hopefully for commercial availability. So you can see here, there's no easy way to understand the differences, but there are ways to systematize how we are thinking about the differences. And that's why I think that where I think the CARES paradigm can really help people um, who are working with these devices. Um, I, as a little pet project, our team at the Barbara Davis Center has started a website called the BDC Panther Diabetes website. It's a it is currently for clinicians and people with diabetes to help understand the difference between these devices. And if you go on my website, you can see there's a clinicians tab, which has this CARES framework laid out for a variety of systems. It doesn't just apply to hybrid closed loop. It applies to all advanced diabetes systems, which also includes the PLGS and LGS systems. So here's an example of the um, CARES paradigm laid out for predictive and low glucose suspend systems. So this is a free resource for anybody who's interested in kind of um, understanding the difference between devices, both in the predictive low glucose and low glucose suspend realm, as well as the hybrid closed loop realm, like we, what we've talked about today. So in my last few minutes, I would like to talk about um, other ways or other things that we can think about as we are seeing more and more individuals with diabetes who are using advanced diabetes devices. There are, the good news is there are some things that are, that are common to all of these systems. Um, working in the research environment with, you know, four times as many systems as actually come to commercial use, we found it's really important to maintain our patient education around bolus Bolusing is still a fundamental part of hybrid closed loop therapy um, that is essential to maintaining euglycemia. Until we have um, what would be considered more of a fully closed loop system, I think our education to individuals with diabetes um, should not change. I think we made a mistake when some of these early devices came out where we said, you know what, you don't have to worry about bolusing as much because the system is automating basal delivery. But what we found when that happens is that glycemic control deteriorates pretty rapidly. So bolusing is still very important for every system I talked about today and the systems in the foreseeable future as well. Pre-bolusing is also important for carbohydrates because when systems are ramping up insulin delivery after um, after a, a rise from carbohydrate load, it can, actually, it can cause um, hypoglycemia later if that bolus is given after the fact because the system has already been trying to um, 
increase insulin delivery for that hyperglycemic peak that comes with carbohydrate intake. So bolusing frequently and bolusing before meals is still important teaching. Um, we've also learned to consider treating hypoglycemia with less carbohydrates. This could be five to 10 grams of carbohydrate. But if, uh, if a user is experiencing hypoglycemia on an advanced diabetes device, they've likely had insulin suspended for a period of time before that low occurred. And so it will take likely less carbohydrate to increase uh, glucose levels to euglycemia. Basic pump hygiene is probably more important than ever. I think um, as clinicians and educators, the most important thing we can do is remind individuals that infusion sets can still fail. This is absolutely the reason for hyperglycemia, DKA, and ketones in advanced diabetes devices. Um, it's important to review how to give a manual injection, when to replace your set, and how to monitor for ketones when glucose levels are high. And finally, these systems are developed by engineers who are hoping that individuals with diabetes will be able to take more of a hands-off approach to diabetes devices. And so um, we found that individuals who are willing to let the system work um, tend to do best with it. Um, there's also ways you can trick systems and overthink parameters and try to second guess what the system is doing, try to make uh, either dosing changes or behavior changes that may actually set themselves up for to fight against the system. And this, we run into more trouble both psychologically as well as um, with glycemic targets where tricking systems or trying to, trying to figure out ways to outdo it can actually lead to more glycemic variability. And it also leads to a lot of stress with the user constantly trying to fight what the system is doing. So I think another part of um, success with advanced diabetes devices is learning to, to trust the system and letting it do what's, what it's intended to do and using it how it's meant to be used. This may not lead to every minute improvement in glycemic control, but it will lead to overall improvement in glycemic control and reduced variability. One last point I want to make is that um, we as clinicians can greatly enhance our, uh, the user experience with type 1 diabetes advanced devices by, by guiding expectations, by asking individuals what their goals are for using this device. What do they expect will change about the regimen? How often do they expect to interact with the system? This can give, um, this can start some good conversations around what they actually expect the system can do and then giving them um, kind of a larger tolerance for, for learning the system and the learning curve that comes for each one. Um, some of the things that I talk about with expectations include workload. How often are they expecting to need to do finger stick blood glucose monitoring? And when does the system itself need it? Do they need to be doing finger sticks for dosing or calibrations or system alerts? Uh, glycemic control is an interesting one because I, I am a big believer that all systems out there, clinical trials have shown that they will improve time and range and reduce hypoglycemia depending on the type of system. I do not care if there's a 2% difference in that or 5% difference in that. The, um, the overall goal for individuals with diabetes are use the device and you should see improvement in glycemic control. I would not get hung up on comparing device to device. They're all designed to improve time and range and reduce hypoglycemia. And then finally, um, the expectation of what will be automatic versus in manual control. It's interesting because you would, you know, I assume that many people want to have um, less control and have more of the insulin being automated, but many people with diabetes prefer to have some of the control themselves and be able to maintain their control over that. So having these discussions about what they can customize and what they can fine tune and how much do they even want to do that can really help set the stage for success with advanced diabetes devices as well. So um, in conclusion, advanced diabetes devices are here. They've been here for a few years now, and it's important that we as clinicians have a framework for how to think about them. Um, each system will do things slightly differently, and that includes systems within the same class. I illustrated that today with the hybrid closed loop devices, and there's clinical implications for that. We do not have to know everything about these systems. Um, we do need to understand roughly and on a high level, how the systems calculate insulin delivery, how we can make adjustments to insulin doses, when to revert to open loop therapy, key education points for each device, and important differences between the sensor and the share features for each device as well. 
Thank you very much for your attention today. Uh, my website, or the, Panther, the BDC Panther Diabetes website is on the left of your screen, and my personal email is on the right side if you have any questions or want to discuss advanced diabetes devices further, I would be happy to connect with you. So I wanna thank you very much for your time today.